Okay, let's go. So, good evening, welcome everybody uh, to our online uh, conversation on what went wrong with liberalism and what to do about it. Uh, this is uh, the final and closing event to an uh, all-day workshop we already had today uh, on rethinking liberalism with a very international uh, set of participants uh, from Russia, Norway, Israel, Great Britain, Poland, uh, Germany. And uh, for me it was an extremely inspiring uh, an event uh, with a lot of ideas uh, I, I still have to, to digest. Uh, so we will see if we will be able to, uh, tonight to draw some conclusions uh, from um, a long day of very intense uh, Zang discussions. Um, uh, maybe I will we'll, we'll start with briefly explaining what are we meaning if we are talking about liberalism. This is not a partisan uh, issue, um, uh, but uh, a set of um, ideas, a school of thought and of uh, the policies um, which are putting the individual freedom in, at the very center uh, of um, liberal thinking. As Hannah Arendt uh, said uh, that uh, liberty, uh, this is the, the basic aim, the basic goal of, of all politics. And um, I would say if you're looking um, back to, to the last 250 years or so, liberalism has being the most successful um, political um, school. Um, but today um, it, it lost a lot of its uh, like attraction, a lot of its uh, momentum. Uh, and uh, liberal democracies um, are in a, in a both uh, internal crisis and uh, confronted with the external challenges, uh, we will uh, talk about this this uh, evening. I would say there's a threefold uh, challenge to to liberal uh, to liberalism. First, um, we are confronted with anti-liberal nationalist uh, xenophobic movements in established democracies, especially in Western Europe and the United States. Um, we are facing an anti-liberal regression in countries uh, which already had been on their way towards uh, democracy uh, like uh, Turkey, uh, Hungary, Poland. Um, and we see uh, a, a challenge by self-assertive authoritarian powers like China and Russia, which sees themselves more and more as uh, alternative model uh, to liberal Zang democracies. Um, and part of our conversation tonight will be how did that happen if you compare uh, the current situation with uh, the 19th, uh, with the, I would say, golden decade of uh, Zang liberalism, um, with uh, the, the f freedom uh, revolutions in Central Eastern Europe, the former Soviet, uh, than empire um, and the illusion that now the whole world uh, would converge in a model of liberal democracy and than market economy. Of course, uh, this has uh, turned out as an as an error, as an historical than error. I would say due uh, to the success of uh, this liberal revolution, but also the shortcomings of liberal politics. Yeah. Um, so, and we will uh, try to, to figure out that, uh, that a little bit um, deeper than tonight. But uh, then, after looking to the root causes for the crisis of uh, liberal politics, um, looking for answers, yeah, how to revive. Um, liberal democracies and how to revive liberalism uh, as a uh, policy of freedom. Um, 
We have uh, four speakers um, uh, with us tonight. Uh, I will start with Professor Tanja Börzel, um, Professor for Political Science uh, and co-director of the International uh, Research Cluster Contestations of the Liberal Script. A very interesting global undertaking. Um, so welcome. Um, then um, Karen Horn. Karen Horn um, is an economist uh, by training, professor at the University uh, of, uh, in, in, in Erfurt, uh, and I would say a very well-known publicist and, and, and journalist, uh, one of uh, the remarkable voices in, let's say, the tradition of uh, liberal uh, philosophy and uh, then economy. Welcome, Karen. Um, Amit Shaim again is uh, with us uh, online, um, professor at the IDC Herzliya, one of uh, Israel's leading universities. Um, and we already over the last years uh, had been uh, working together on the, the issues we are, we are talking um, about uh, tonight. I'm glad you are with us, Amit Shaim. And finally, last not least, Goran Boldyovsky. He is the director of the Berlin office of uh, the Open Society Foundations. I would say the most powerful um, and um, the, the maybe also the most interesting uh, f uh, democracy promotion uh, than foundation, civil society organization fun uh, funded by George Soros uh, with uh, global activities. Uh, so, um, welcome, Goran. Um, I would um, like to, to invite Tanya Börsel to, to open our discussion with some introductory remarks. Uh, that I, I, we should have inputs of around about seven minutes and then go into a, a lively uh, conversation. Uh, with the opportunity to take part also to put questions from from the audience, please. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and as you already said, Ralph, liberalism is under pressure. Some say it's in crisis and some, some get even go so far to say it's in decay. And that's exactly what our cluster of excellence, Contestations of a Liberal Script, is um, researching on. We want to find out why um, the li liberalism is under pressure, and what precisely is under pressure, and um, what kind of effects this will have. Um, and what I hope to do in the next six and a half minutes is to draw on our conceptual framework um, to come up with some interesting um, responses to the question, what went wrong with liberalism and how could we possibly fix it, based also on the discussions we had today, which I found extremely stimulating, and I'm still... As, as you said, Ralph, I'm still digesting. It's amazing how much ground we covered in such a short time. It was a real pleasure to be able to participate. So let me start by saying that um, liberalism is contested, seriously contested, but it's not for the first time, right? I mean, so in fact, some argue that the history of liberalism has actually advanced and evolved and unfolded through contestation. And um, that brings me to my second point. These contestations do not necessarily have to result in a weakening or in a decay, right? They can actually have the opposite effect. They mm. can strengthen liberalism or they can lead to a new version or variety of liberalism to a, as Timothy Garten Ash put it today, to a liberal renewal, right? So I think it's still an open question what the current contestations of liberalism, what kind of effects this will have on liberalism. And for me, it's not a foregone conclusion that it will result in a decline or decay or demise of liberalism. So um, the third point I wanted to make is that, and I th that the, the question of the consequences of these contestations in our, so, so we um, assume, depend a lot on the, on the types of contestation. And here we make an important distinction between contestations within liberalism uh, versus contestation 
of liberalism as such, right? And I think this is a really important uh, distinction. It, it seems to me that our debates and also our research is a little bit biased towards what we call external contestations, illiberal contestations, li contestations that reject liberalism altogether. Whereas, particularly within liberal societies, I think a lot of the contestations are not against liberal idea of, or, of liberal ideas and policies. Uh, but much more about the way liberalism is practiced, if you want. Michael Sun um, started this morning by arguing, I think very convincingly, that people, you know, our surveys show that people still support liberal ideas and institutions, liberal democracy, even policies. What they are dissatisfied with are the practices, the way liberal democracy is working. And I think this is a very important um, um, very important observation, and if this, if this is the case, if at least a significant part of the contestations are more internal uh, rather than external, I think we face a paradox, because why is it then that people who want, in fact, more liberalism, or at least a different, a new type, variety of liberalism, support parties that reject liberalism? Right? Um, and I think this is this is a question, and um, that is the third part of my remarks, where I, I got a lot of food for thought out of our discussions today, because I think different participants in the workshop had different ideas of why is it that we see support for non-liberal, illiberal parties that reject liberalism altogether uh, by a lot of people who actually are quite happy with liberalism as such but want to work differently, right? Why is that? And just to very briefly, Carolina Vigura, she focused very much on emotions, and she argues that these anti-liberal or non-liberal forces um, have a way of mobilizing the fears of loss that are produced by the success of liberalism. And then, of course, the answer would be, or how you address this is, um, and that was something I think Timothy Gardnesh came up with, was the idea of a liberal patriotism. The kind of liberal patriotism I think the pulse of Europe managed uh, to, to, to mobilize, uh, you know, um, particularly right before uh, the, the last elections to the European Parliament. And you could argue quite successfully, at least voter turnout was higher than, you know, it stopped, it reversed the decline. So you can say this is an example of liberal patriotism. Um, that actually has been quite effective and successful. Um, Timothy Gardner, she focused on the, what he called the multidimensional inequality. So it's not only about income inequality or wealth inequality, but he talked of different kinds of educational inequality. And, I th and he also put forward a, a sort of a manifesto of ways of how we can address these inequalities. I don't want to go into detail here, I just want to flag that uh, he focuses on a different dimension, but also came up with uh, interesting uh, solutions how to address these multi-dimensional inequalities. And finally, Michael Zürn um, focused very much on, on sort of political factors. And as he said, you know, the people are dissatisfied with the ways liberal democracies is working. And he focused very much on two issues. Um, one is the um, delegation of decision making to um, institutions that are not directly democratically accountable. And this is a strategy, in fact, we also observe very much in the European Union, where uh, governments of the member states tend to delegate controversial decisions to either independent decision-making bodies such as the Central Bank, the European Central Bank, for instance, or the European Commission, or they sort of take these decisions behind closed doors very much as an emergency, in a, so claiming this is an emergency situation, so there can't be any uh, a debate. We have to decide quickly, and there is no alternative. So these are the kind of, um, this is one, um, one working um, of, of liberal democracy, um, people are very unhappy with, dissatisfied with. And the other point he pointed to was the fact that the people who actually are represented in, in parliament, which is the, uh, the institution that holds governments accountable, are uh, very biased towards a specific kind of liberalism, which is what he calls liberal cosmopolitanism. Okay, now the question is, how do we address these issues? I mean, how do you make um, decision-making more democratically accountable? How, give, how do you give people the feeling mm. that they actually have a say, that their mm. voices are heard? I think um, 
One way of doing this, of course, is um, make uh, these decision makers less subject to uh, a public controversy. Rather than seeking to depoliticize de issues by delegating decisions to independent or non-majoritarian decision-making bodies, force them to sort of discuss these decisions and have parliaments much sort of, you know, there has been a tendency of disempowering parliaments by executives or experts taking decisions. Put the parliaments back into power, if you wish. And that is something mm. governments have very much been driving. So it's not the international institutions that have disempowered parliaments. It ha it's, it's partly their own governments. So to conclude, I think that would be one way. The other, and that is, I don't have t too much time to elaborate, but by delegating decision making, the decisions on controversial decisions, that by delegating the power to take these decisions to non-majoritarian institutions, institutions that are not directly democratically accountable, what you tend to do is you turn distributional issues into regulatory problems. Uh, to give you an example, the Euro crisis was all about we need stricter rules and then we need to give independent bodies enforcement powers. It was not about issues of redistribution, right, of burden sharing. The same in the migration crisis. The solution to, to, the, re look at, sort of to the migration crisis is rules, obligatory quotas, and then an enforcement uh, authority that actually you know, makes sure that these rules are complied with. And regulatory policies are not capable of dealing with distributional consequences, we know that, plus these distributional consequences are then get politicized. And this is what people turn against, and this is why people ha they feel have no say. So to conclude, to summarize, I think what we need to do is we need to deal with distributional issues in parliaments. It may take longer, but trying to solve these issues by delegating them, these decisions, to independent authorities that then turn them into regulatory issues backfires big time and to a large extent, in my view, explains the internal contestations of liberalism. Thank you very much. Um, perfect introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, invite now Amit Shai uh, to continue. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph, and I will continue. Uh, very much in the vein uh, that Tanya has um, has uh, started. Um, I also want to say how greatly I enjoyed um, our uh, workshop uh, earlier today. I found it very rich and um, and and very re rewarding. Um, let me pick up on the point that Tanya uh, started with. I think it's a very important point, uh, which is that the history of liberalism is a history of a series of, of contestations. It is religious toleration winning uh, over uh, religious fanaticism and doctrine in Europe in the latter half of the 17th century. It is limited government, Republican government, uh, winning over um, uh, absolutist government in the 18th and early 19th century. Uh, it is the welfare state um, uh, winning the war against, uh, against uh, abject uh, poverty. And it is uh, liberal democracy and liberal internationalism uh, fighting and winning the war uh, against totalitarianism in the 20, 20th century. So uh, contestation is very much uh, part of the genealogy of liberalism, but there's a very important but. Liberalism has survived and thrived because it emerged victorious out of these contestations. It has shown itself adaptable and resilient, uh, but also victorious, and it was uh, undergirded by good ideas, uh, better political functionality, better economic performance, and ultimately better uh, power uh, by leading states in the international system. I think we have to be, we have to acknowledge that contestation, but we also have to be very uh, realistic um, that um, we cannot assume the inherent moral superiority of, of liberalism as much as we are attached to the values uh, of liberty, that that alone will win the day in the 21st uh, century. So I think uh, contestation, yes, but ultimately 
liberalism has to deliver, uh, and it has to deliver on the level of ideas, on the level of uh, political functionality, and ultimately uh, on the level of uh, technological and economic and even military, military power. Uh, we are facing uh, increasingly powerful illiberal and anti-liberal elements uh, in the world, and so contestation is not enough. We have to assume that we need to provide better solutions than the, the alternative. There is a silver lining, and I think Tanya um, uh, quite rightly um, cautions us against uh, panic uh, about uh, the, the, the demise, the eminent demise of liberalism. Liberals always feared the imminent demise of, of liberalism. And uh, I actually see signs in the world um, that uh, suggest to me that in some respects, we are freer, more liberal world today than we were even uh, maybe not 30 or 40 years ago, but certainly 100 and 200 uh, years ago. When I consider uh, the extraordinary uh, consensus around science in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, not just in the West, but around the world. I mean, if this pandemic was happening 100 years ago, we would still have a real uh, a tussle between rationality and science and between religious explanations. We've seen, we've seen none of that uh, in, in any significant extent, which is extraordinary. We've also seen elites around the world willing to put the economy into a coma and to impose incredible economic costs in order to save uh, human lives, and especially the, the, the lives of the most uh, weak and vulnerable in our societies. That to me is also a sign of great uh, liberal progress. And if we, I, I just read the latest Arab uh, uh, barometer, uh, which um, uh, asked a series of questions about a desire for political freedom, desire for political openness, uh, desire for democracy and political openness has never been greater in North Africa and the Middle East than it is uh, today. So um, we have to uh, um, look to the future uh, realistically, but also with optimism and understanding that this is a long, a long historical uh, struggle. Let me just say a couple of words um, about what went wrong um, and perhaps also uh, uh, mention a, a couple of things that um, uh, we didn't really get around to earlier today in our, in our, in our workshop. Um, we've spoken quite a bit about the spell of 1989, what I like to call the Fukuyama coma, um, the, um, uh, the assumption that we were all uh, living under until very recently, um, which is tinged with historical determinism that once we achieve the triumph, the Western triumph over fascism and communism at the end of the Cold War, um, liberal order would somehow spread uh, by osmosis, uh, unaided. And, uh, and this has bred a lot of complacency uh, and a lot of uh, laziness. Uh, and and we, we discussed this uh, quite a bit. A question that came up for me earlier today and which I really grapple with, and I would very much appreciate if you could have a conversation about this, is um, the idea that actually our liberal orders are maintained by conservative values, okay? Um, and, and that is something that we haven't grappled with uh, earlier uh, today. Uh, there are uh, critics of uh, liberalism uh, who suggest that the current failure of liberalism is really the outcome of our uh, uh, collective uh, failure to nurture the roots that are necessary uh, for a vibrant, um, robust uh, liberal order. Things like civic virtue, uh, active citizenship, which Hannah Arendt placed such a great emphasis on as a bul bulwark against, against authoritarianism. Um, Perhaps we've become, uh, instead of citizens, we've become consumers of rights and we've taken prosperity and peace um, and the state providing us with all sorts of goods uh, uh, too much um, uh, as, uh, for granted. And, and, and as a result, we've really um, starved the roots um, of uh, modern liberal order um, 
from its, uh, its nurturing values and responsibility of active citizenship. This is something uh, that I think we should at least consider. I think it's something that as liberals, we, we're not very comfortable with. We, we don't quite like to bring in uh, conservatism and perhaps uh, religious faith, uh, sacrifice, civic virtue, uh, into our discussions. Uh, we feel a little bit uncomfortable uh, with that uh, sometimes, mm. but I think it's something that we need to uh, grapple with. Um, the Have final point that I will make, Ralph, if I may, yeah, one, one final, final point. Um, I, I think that one of the uh, things that make our historical moment different from previous crises of liberalism is the idea that politics will follow geopolitics. What I mean by that is that if we look at the, the history, certainly of the last 200 years, and some would say the last 500 years, um, the ecology, the, um, uh, the environment that allowed for the formation and development of uh, modern political orders was really guaranteed, was undergirded by a liberal, a broadly speaking liberal hegemon. Uh, some would say first, uh, firstly the, the British Empire and then the United States. We find ourselves for the very first time in the history of modernity without a uh, convincing, powerful uh, Western hegemonic uh, power that would guarantee the rules and arrangements of liberal order. Here I think we are entering uh, uncharted uh, historical uh, waters. And the question is whether our liberal orders are attractive enough and robust enough to be able to survive and thrive in an environment where we really have a powerful anti-liberal uh, hegemonic competitor uh, in, the, in the form of communist China. Thanks a lot. Um... There's a lot of uh, stuff <coughs> we, we will follow up uh, during the, the discussion. I just want to pick out two uh, arguments of yours. The first one was the paradoxy uh, that obviously liberal ideas and values are still thriving and vivid in authoritarian uh, regimes. Yeah, if we are looking today to, to Belarus, Uh, or the democratic resistance in Hong Kong, or the uh, liberal opposition in Poland, or the, uh, the last uh, uh, election results in, in Turkey. So I would say the, the, the spirit uh, of liberalism and uh, the, the idea of uh, the dignity of the individual, of uh, self-determination, the rule of law, these are still very powerful ideas, but in the core countries of the liberal world, uh, what we had been calling uh, uh, the West, um, we see a decline of uh, the, the uh, trust in liberal institutions and uh, uh, the democratic uh, the parties. Uh, so I think we, we have to think about this kind of paradoxy and the second um, um, issue is this How do liberals deal with, I would say, conservative values and needs yeah? for, the, for, for belonging, for security, for community, for solidarity? If we neglect uh, these uh, uh, values, uh, uh, so they will fire back. Yeah? They will be occupied by uh, right-wing populists and, and anti-liberal Uh, forces and turned into a weapon against uh, the liberal uh, uh, democracies. Um, Goran, please take the floor. Goran Budjoski. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I have to say, you know, when, when, when I hear you you talking, I, I have a one single day in my mind. And that's uh, uh, actually early May 2004 at the banks of River Danube in Hungary. Uh, celebrating the accession of Hungary and other countries. I happened to be there. Uh, a year later, I, I got employed in the foundation, and I felt I have to look for a new job uh, already then, because the democratization and the development will be soon over. 
uh, what a false expectation. And I think um, probably uh, I would really not say what went wrong, but I would say what false expectations we gathered along this way. And by now it's good 15 years. Because already in the Open Society Foundations, 2007-2008, uh, one of the main programs that I was working on was actually analyzing populist parties and extreme right in Hungary, in Poland and the East. And then, of course, we knew what we all know what happened with Orban, who decided that the liberal uh, uh, politics is not good for uh, uh, personal enrichment and success in politics. He totally dumped it and built something totally uh, different. Uh, I'll, I'll refrain of talking about Orban. Maybe later, uh, I can do a lot. But as I follow not only my journey but the journey of my foundation, at the moment I'm, I'm, I'm overseeing our European programs. Guess what? We are active in France, where actually, if you look at who has the worst law on anti-terrorism, it's France, not Poland, not Hungary. If you look who has the worst law on basically public protests, everybody probably in this virtual room will sign up for Poland and Hungary, it will be Spain. Uh, and I think these are one of the issues that somehow over time we took for granted, that there were these holes in the systems in the West when they were actually poking. And that means that if you're a leftist activist in Spain, you feel that you're not equal citizen. If you're 10% Muslim people in France and you're discriminated uh, multiple times, and I think in spite of the fact that uh, desegregated data on race is not uh, uh, collected in France, we still have ample evidence of how much stop and search is done and so on, you still feel that even you have your French passport, even your second, third generation, you don't feel as a citizen. And I think, to me, these are the negative examples. And this is not to relativize. I mean, Orban and Kaczynski are extremes, but we forgot the holes. And I just want to point out that when we look at the past. Let's not forget, I think, uh, we liberal-minded people, we are very good at self-flagellating. I mean, like, like mm -hmm. we always forget about the successes or we take them for granted. Uh, even in that Eastern Europe that we witness today, you have one Zuzana Chaputova that refused to enter the narrative of the extreme right and the populist and comfortably win elections in Slovakia, which is not a beacon of liberalism, as it, as it were. Um, then Ireland. Let's not forget a very significant religious feeling and undertone. And they managed 2018, after so many years of civic engagement, to repeal a, a, a draconian abortion uh, a, a ban. Afterwards, they moved also on the LGBT rights. Actually, there's some things where a, a real progress for people have been made. I have colleagues, gay couples, who with surrogacy have friends with two fathers, two mothers. That is unthinkable for my old mother. My grandma probably would have gone to church and, and crossed her, uh, her hand three times. I think it's important to take that a lot of things have, uh, have happened. Now, um, moving on on what should be done. I think, first of all, we have to acknowledge and we have to see in my opinion, there are three domains, and, and I work a lot with civil society, and I will say guilty on all charges, most of the civil society. Um, in the East, it left in the zeal of the wave where everybody was riding, uh, uh, and even when we noticed that Orban was there, so many organizations, well, no, this will pass. It didn't. In the West, actually, there is a lot of need for conversations like the one that we have today. Because somehow it has been outsourced. I mean, academia does a great job. Government does a great job. But this conversation should be also around the dinner table. And I felt that people took it for granted. Three areas of action. One is economy. We keep on forgetting that actually a lot of bad rap for economy is taken by liberals. Well, actually, the key decisions were made by conservatives. It was the CDU government uh, that actually put the draconian measures on Greece and made a whole country to go through a, a, a kind of a warlike uh, uh, dep uh, economic depression uh, without thinking about the people. It was not the liberals, but everybody will say it's a neoliberal politics that did it. Mm. I think we have to, uh, liberals have to look at what economies does, but also they have to take the responsibility of what they feel that, and the others, they have to point what others then. Second um, uh, area, digital domain. I, if I think today we had a great conversation about the environment. I'll say a word about that. But I think in Europe, we have an amazing opportunity to recreate our rights 
through the digital domain and then bring them back in the real space. As no one else does, luckily in this case because we do not have the Googles and the Facebooks. And maybe we, we are able to regulate them. Maybe. We'll see. But a lot of these things actually brings a potential. And frankly, the, the space, the digital space, is really, really open for a pro-liberal intervention. Actually, there are plenty of those, but I think we need a lot of zeal. And on top of that, Europe has a plan, as imperfect as it is. And finally, the environment. And I think environment, but not only as the plans that we hear from Timmermans and alike and von der Leyen, I think also environment as it is lived through the individual experiences of people. Where I come from, Eastern Europe or the Balkans, nobody will talk to you about the environment. But when you mention pollution, everybody will jump on that. And there will be a rallying cry. And, and actually, if you go one by one, you will find those rallying cries. And I think that the liberals will find their place, civil society organizations, political parties, people like you, thinkers, uh, to contribute to this. And I'm actually, I have to say, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. And in, in, uh, in this respect, I would uh, uh, agree with Professor Berzel to look actually at the internal cracks and fix them and make the thinking and the operation the delivery stronger, because I think that will be also the best defense uh, uh, mechanism as well for the external challenges that we inevitably uh, European democracy will, uh, will face. One thing that I, I hope to discuss later, and I deliberately didn't touch it because I don't think it's a problem of the liberals, but it's a problem of the European society, and that is uh, the uh, latent and present discrimination. Also, a lot of uh, racialized groups that exist on our earth, and neither liberals nor, nor conservatives have an idea of how to build the societies around that. But I, I'm not going to talk about that because I don't think that it's a, just a liberal problem. Uh, I think probably conservatives have it on their hands more than the liberal-minded people. I stop there. Thanks a lot. Go on. Uh, also for the this more differentiated picture you had been, been, been drawing that we should be careful not to um, drive ourselves in a, in a kind of uh, perception trap that uh, then liberalism is on the defense, on the, the, the whole front. No, no, it's, it's much more a mixed uh, picture we are, we are facing uh, today and reminding us that we have to deal with uh, new challenges uh, and, and find liberal answers uh, to um, developments like uh, digital revolution and climate change. Um, as uh, Amit Shai said, we have to deliver. <laughs> <laughs> we have to prove that liberal democracies are able to deal with these new challenges in a successful way. So, Karen, what are you in, intrigued to, to comment on? Karen. Thank you for having me in this discussion tonight. Well, the question is what is, went wrong with liberalism and what to do about it. Um, and I'll just try to put a couple of items on the table for us to discuss. Um, but at first, let me say that uh, I also don't believe we should be indulging in autoflagellation at this point. I'm even not sure that we were overconfident and overreaching, as, as it was said earlier. I think we were hoping for the best and we were optimistic. And that's a feature that we need also in the future as we go on. Um, today, like yesterday, liberty is an essential value to strive for. And liberalism is the fruit of a rich philosophical tradition, uh, one that has inspired the evolution of Western political institutions. And it has brought us to a consider considerable degree, um, peace, progress, pluralism, and prosperity. Uh, liberalism is about protecting the individual so that Private, political, and social power won't crush it. And that's important. By the same token, liberalism is about tolerance. It's about equality and respect. And that's something we absolutely cannot do without. And in that sense, I don't think anything has gone wrong with liberalism. But of course, you're right. One cannot be happy with the state of the world. We have to be alarmed by the rise of illiberalism and the dismantling of liberal institutions that we see. And so I do believe that is always helpful, not just to point at other people, but also to ask what we ourselves 
uh, did wrong, where we failed, and whether we had some some blind spots, perhaps, in our worldview. And I do indeed see a couple of points where different attitudes, political strategies, and, and perhaps narratives may be needed today. And some of the adjustments that I will suggest you will see are to some extent and situational or context driven. And that has to do with the fact that we argue and act and also need to argue and act in such a way as to counterbalance what we perceive as bad developments. And these bad developments change over time. For example, we have long felt the need, I don't know, for a hundred years or so, even before we were around, um, to ward off influences from the more extreme left. And so given that tradition, some of us woke up rather belatedly to the fact that we also need to ward off the influences from the more extreme right, from nationalists, racists, um, isolationists, people denying human equality and pluralism. Conservative groups have long been allies fighting um, in, 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 the, in the combat against the left, but some of them now have drifted toward the right-wing extremes. And that means that as liberals, we can no longer go along with them. We were allies and we shouldn't be anymore. Turning away from them, however, does not mean that we change our direction. It just means that we have another front line that has opened up and that we need to fight on. Um, for a long time, liberal voices um, have concentrated on free markets. And that's one of the points where I think we might want to change a little bit the, the, the image that we give. Advocating free markets is still a good and a very necessary thing, especially when the scope of government involves uh, increases and uh, when it threatens to stifle the dynamism of, of private enterprise and, and, and well, the progress that that can bring about. But we must correct the image that liberalism is only about markets. And we must correct the image that by free markets, we understand markets void of any kind of regulation whatsoever. Markets, of course, do need a good framework. And that framework is defined by the law. The law is set within the procedures of democratic legislation, which is enshrined in our constitutions. And these are the fruit, not only of history, but also of philosophy and a lot of um, experience. It is a deplorable fact that many people associate liberalism almost exclusively to with the economic argument for, let's say, lower taxes for corporations. I think we need to correct this impression. If that is what is perceived as the liberal mantra, then one shouldn't be surprised that um, liberalism is seen as an ideology, ideology of capital. The discourse of some liberal voices indeed has shrunk to exactly this, and that's not enough. That said, of course, regulation should never be stifling and taxes shouldn't be distortionary and confiscatory, that's, that's clear. Another thing, um, liberals excel in saying no to almost everything that is coming from the top. And they often do so in a, what I feel is a very corrosive way. It's a way that contributes to the erosion of important institutions and social capital. We need to acknowledge that there are common goods that we cannot do without and we should contribute to them in a way that benefits all. In doing so, we need to acknowledge, for example, that bottom-up reactions to major prices like this one require a lot of time and they're costly. They're costly in all kinds of respects. COVID-19 should have taught us by now that in an emergency at least, um, we, we ha don't have time for individual reactions sort of building up to create something at the collective level. We need to in in engage in collective action. Self-responsibility is important and we cannot do without it, but it would be foolish not to think that collective action is also part of our self-responsibility. As individuals, we live in a context, and in this context with other people, we need to engage in collective action. The public sector, when it's ill-equipped, cannot deliver. The public sector, we have seen what it means when it is ill-equipped. Um, uh, the, the public is not just some abstract leviathan, it's all of us and the tools that we give ourselves for concrete action. 
yes, we must prevent that body from growing fat, but that shouldn't mean that we give up on, on efficiency. But still, what I mean is, we, we, if we just fight the state, as um, some people do who call themselves liberals, then we just miss the boat. Then liberalism also has a lot to offer. It has much more to offer than just that. And I think we must better explain our core values and the virtues that are implied by them and show our humanism. Um, we, Amichai mentioned the conservative values earlier that uh, might be needed to promote liberalism. I'm not sure they're conservative values. <laughs> I think they are liberal values because they start from the idea that human beings are equal and that they, just, they owe each other, therefore, equal respect. So um, I think we, we do have this in the paradigm of liberalism and we don't need to go fishing, fishing elsewhere. Um, if we believe that a more participatory approach is needed in politics, for example, and I'm very sympathetic to that, then something else comes up, and that is the need to explain. We need to explain a lot more things. We must explain that we not only fight for our own liberty, but for everyone's liberty. We must explain that we seek to serve and help everybody, that the aim is to make everybody better off, not just the happy few. That may, of course, be clear to most of us, but maybe not for our critics who try to hold us responsible for that. And yes, we can answer that. Um, we must explain that we care about a lot more things than just plain GDP. Karen, we I must explain I that... Can remind you on the limits of time? Yep, just two sentences or so. Uh, we, I, I think we must explain that um, defending the individual has nothing to do with denying social bonds or the need of political exchange. And we must explain that the law too is here to protect and not to stifle democracy. Often the law and our insistence on the rule of law is seen as something that stifles democracy and takes away the power to decide in, in the collective. That is not the case. We must explain that democracy encapsulates liberty and that it needs checks and balances. That's uh, something we need to do a lot more. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Then Karen, I think it um, was, was one of the, the, the important um, findings of our today's workshop, what you had been referring to, that we have to overcome, I would say, false contradictions. Uh, false contradictions between individual like, freedom and collective uh, safeguards uh, between uh, the market and uh, uh, state uh, regulation uh, and to acknowledge and to, to recognize as liberals that um, there's a legitimate task of uh, public policy uh, to protect, to regulate and to redistribute uh, and that the controversy should not be about if uh, these are uh, necessary tasks of the state, but how? Yeah, it's about how to, to regulate the, uh, the markets, how to provide uh, collective uh, security in times of, of uh, the rapid change. Um, so we have a first uh, question here from our audience. Um, uh, I would say. Uh, a thesis uh, to, to uh, a debate. Uh, I quote, in almost all of history, liberalism has been a privilege of the elites. Is it true? The conservative backlash uh, or the anti-liberal backlash is by the people who are denied participation in liberal societies. So, uh, has, uh, is, is has liberalism historically been a project of the, the elites? And uh, perhaps today it is perceived as um, the uh, project of the uh, privileged, the rich, the successful, the beautiful ones, and neglecting those who are living uh, in the shadows. Um, is this a problem we, we have to co uh, confront? Who wants to answer? Okay. Um, I partly agree and I partly disagree. I think uh, 
Historically, it's correct. The observation is correct that major contestants of liberalism were people who felt actually were excluded from liberalism. And they invoke liberal ideas and principles to extend liberalism. Yeah. Work, women, non whites, right? It's, that's the history. It's sexual minorities. That's how the liberalism evolved. And liberal, bro, bro, that's what I meant at the beginning. Contestations of liberalism have been a driving force of the extension of liberalism. So, in that way, yes. The conservative backlash, though, came from the losers of this extension of liberalism, those who lost the privileges. I mean, the, the quintessential white, old male that is overwhelmingly supporting, that are overwhelmingly supporting Trump and voted for Brexit, right? I mean, why? Because they lost. They're losing to women, they're losing, or they feel they're losing to, to minorities, they feel threatened, and those are the... the, 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 the so, and, and finally, I think it is fair to say that elites, the elites, if they are the elites, but elites favor a certain type of liberalism, that what Michael Zorn calls liberal cosmopolitanism. And there is a tension between open and closed societies. You know? I mean, there is something to be said that you need a certain closure for liberal societies to survive. And that, that there's a tension between openness and closure. And the question is, how closed have societies to be in order to survive as liberal societies? And here, liberal, the, the elites clearly favor inclusion and openness. That liberalism is, is an exclusive project of the elites. I think that is historically wrong mm. and uh, also doesn't describe our current situation. Mm. Um, in our workshop today, uh, Timothy Garten Ash uh, made a comment that uh, liberal minds sh should not only look to the 50% of the world. Uh, who are less privileged, who are fighting with poverty and uh, everyday uh, burdens of, of uh, the life. Uh, but we should have a, a, a closer look and a more sensitivity for the maybe 50%, maybe a little bit less parts of our societies who feel uncomfortable with the uh, success story of liberalization, yeah? who feel uncomfortable with globalization and the growing economic and social insecurity which is going along with it, who feel also uncomfortable with the cultural revolution, the growing cultural diversity, with the gender revolution, you mentioned it, the loss of the uh, privilege of the patriarchalic uh, uh, order. Uh, who feel uncomfortable with uh, intercontinental migration. How sh should we deal with this? How should we deal with this part of our, our society um, who, uh, be it out of social or cultural reasons, is skeptical, critical, or feels threatened? Uh, by this, uh, I would say, liberal modernization on speed. How should we deal with these uh, people? If I may, uh, and let me start with, I'll call him Johan for this occasion, was the painter that I hired to paint the flat that I moved here two years ago, who lives in Reineckersdorf and who probably in the free time was a philosopher and we had a good conversation, obviously, on, on, my, on my bill. But uh, uh, he really pointed very rightly. He said, look, I don't mind that these Bulgarians and Romanians uh, uh, are coming here and do the work. There is enough work for everybody. But you know what? They break my price. And then they go back to Sofia, they go back to Bucharest and elsewhere, and they can live in winter at much cheaper conditions. I can't go there and live there. And, uh, you know, as, as, he, as he were... That actually brought something very clearly to my mind, which was we forgot a bit of the class dimension of the regulation. Because if you're a Bulgarian doctor, or if you're a Romanian nurse, and if you have one of those professions that are regulated, actually you will be subject to a lot of uh, you know, rules that you have to qualify. But if you're a painter and a lot of other professions, actually most likely you can jump over the hoops. 
And I think people like him, actually, he was probably a more radical leftist, at least according to my, my conversation. But I think they had a legitimate sort of a, 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 a claim, and they had a legitimate complaint because they said, okay, where is the state? Why don't we discuss about this issue? And I think one of the issues is not so much about the liberal. I think in the progress, there has been uh, basically a lot of uh, people, significant number, have been simply forgotten. And, and I think we have to acknowledge that. But, uh, but whether they were forgotten just by the architects of liberal policies or they were forgotten by the broader political class or taken for granted, I will probably uh, ascribe for a second. I think that's only part of the answer. It's, it's a much more complex question. But I think um, in, in this sense, we, we sort of equated everybody and we forgot these markers, you know, through class, through ethnicity and a lot of, and somehow we analyze them all, all in its own uh, 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 domain, but we didn't put them together and see what does it mean for the society. And again, coming from the civil society, civil society did the same. You will have an organization that represents migrants. You have an organization that represents Roma, uh, Muslims. And then it's okay, organization that represents white working class. Actually, we work with a lot of white working class. But when you tried to put this together, it didn't make a whole. And I think that was also a failure of, uh, of all segments of society, including the political class, uh, not only the liberal political class. Mm. We have another question here. Isn't the polarization in democratic societies a consequence of growing state action that cannot take into account the diversity of moral values in society? Put differently, democracies have to find a better way how to cope with continuous dissent. Also could say how to cope with those who um, are not in line uh, with the um, dominant um, stream of um, the political and cultural development. This is again the question how to deal with people who, who are on dissent. Yeah, if, uh, you know, I would say there is some notion that they have to disappear. Yeah, they, we have to get rid of them. They, 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 they um, you know, if, if Hillary Clinton was talking in the, in the last uh, US presidential election of the deplorables, yeah, uh, I think this is an attitude which is feeding uh, these kind of anti-liberal populist Zang revolt. On the other hand, we, 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 we cannot just um, follow the resentments or we, we cannot just pay tribute to, to, to phobic resentments or to uh, nationalist uh, uh, notions. So how to, how to deal with this kind of discontent? Amit Shai, do you have an answer? <laughs> It's, um, it's the, it's the million-dollar um, question, uh, isn't it? Um, and it manifests itself differently in, in different countries and, and different, um, different societies. I, I think there's, uh, I, I'd say two things. One is there's uh, something of a paradox going on here because I, I think that in this sense, liberalism is a, is a victim of its own success. Um, over the last um, several decades, uh, we have seen living standards uh, going up uh, quite, quite spectacularly. And by the way, not, not only in, in the West and perhaps not even primarily in the West, but um, in India, in China, um, in Latin America, elsewhere. I think as a result of that, people's expectations of what is a good life or what is a dignified life or what is a life uh, where one gets um, uh, acknowledgement for one's, one's identity, that expectation has also grown um, a lot. Uh, as a result of uh, technological innovation and media, people see how the other half lives, um, uh, and, and that uh, on, on te television and so on and so forth, that feeds in expectation as well. And, and so I think a sense of... Um, of either being ahead or being left behind, uh, a lot of it is really uh, a matter of expectations, right? Um, and so I, I think in, in a way, liberalism has been a victim of its own success in that it nurtured 
a lot of expectations. Not all of them have been um, have been granted, of course, because such expectations are, are really uh, kind of uh, uh, bottomless. Um, but that's only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that I think that there is a, a growing fear uh, of redundancy uh, among uh, people in Western advanced uh, societies and increasingly, I think, in, in other parts of, of the world. Um, I think uh, people's um, uh, confidence in the future, in, in, in the notion, it's called the American dream, that your children's lives will be safer, better, healthier, more prosperous than, than your own life. That confidence, I think, has really been shaken over the last uh, uh, decade, particularly since the financial crisis. And it's taken another big hit now with the COVID-19, with the economic implications of COVID-19. Um, and on top of that, I think that there is a growing insipid fear uh, of redundancy as a result of automation, as a re redundancy as, 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 the re as the result of artificial intelligence uh, coming in and people having a sense that they just don't have um, the, the tools to deal with the complexity of life as they, as they, as they experience and the pace of change. And that produces a, a tremendous amount of, of anxiety and therefore alienation and, um, and, and anger. Um, so it brings me back to the point um, that um, we as liberals need to find um, uh, solutions uh, to this sense of dislocation and anxiety uh, and, and to hopefully find solutions that are more attractive, more inclusive, more persuasive uh, than the populist or the, the, the authoritarian uh, uh, ones. My inclination, and I'm saying this very, very tentatively because I haven't thought this through entirely, so I'm thinking it loud, uh, aloud a, a little bit. I, I really think that we need to double down on the notion of human dignity. And to understand that in the 21st century, our understanding of human dignity extends beyond just mere physical survival and um, satisfying the most basic um, economic needs. Uh, this may have been a huge revelation to people in the uh, first half of the 20th century, uh, the idea of the welfare state and, and providing some, some basic uh, uh, social and political rights, but I think we've gone beyond that. I think the expectation uh, is for a deeper uh, sense of uh, investment in human dignity, a new kind of uh, humanistic uh, liberalism that will say all human lives matter and each and every one of us is precious and we're going to invest in you from the day that you are born, probably before you are born, with prenatal care. And we're going to uh, nurture you to become the uh, most effective, uh, resilient, capable human being that you, that you can be. We can't do that forever. We won't be able economically to sustain you from cradle to grave, but we will invest in you and we will provide you with opportunities for self-realization through education, through healthcare, uh, through building mental and physical well-being and resilience. And one might think about what I would call a 25 for 75. What do I mean by that? Um, we are very close to living in a world in which life expectancy, certainly in the advanced countries, will near 100 years old. So a, 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 a girl born in South Korea today uh, already today is expected to live until the age of about 96, 97. So let's round it up to 100 years. And um, perhaps we, we really should think in, in kind of more radically uh, transformative uh, terms and say, we as a society, we as the state, we will invest in you for the first 25 years of your life, primarily in the first five years of your life, because that's the basis for everything but we will equip you to live in a, in a technologically uh, dynamic, fast-changing, uncertain world. Um, and, then, and then we will expect you uh, 
to be a productive uh, member of society for the remainder of the 75 years of your, of your, of your life. I, I know this sounds uh, a, a, little bit, a little bit vague, but I want to remind everybody that liberalism started off as a radical anti-establishment ideology with radical ideas such as uh, opposition to slavery, that slavery was immoral. I think that fundamentally liberalism has to be committed to individual human flourishing for all human beings. And we really need to orient our educational, economic, social uh, structures for that uh, nurturing uh, activity. Ralph, I don't know if that answers your Please. question, but I think it begins to answer your question. Uh, thanks a lot. I would, I would like to um, uh, just pick out even the, the core argument, uh, as far as I then got it, I think this is the, the traditional the liberal narrative. Yeah, yeah, uh, to invest in people and to empower uh, people to exercise their rights and to make use of their opportunities uh, and to thrive uh, then in a, a life in uh, self-determination. Um, and I like this uh, an, an narrative like, very much, uh, but uh, obviously there are some cracks uh, like in it today, and uh, a lot of people don't believe in it uh, than anymore. If you're looking to uh, most Western societies, we have a decline of social mobility, of social upward than mobility, uh, so there is uh, not more but less uh, than equal than opportunities. You have uh, growing discrepancies in, in, in our educational uh, systems, growing discrepancies in the labor market between those uh, who are uh, benefiting from uh, digitalization and globalization, and for them it's an increase of options and, and opportunities, and the others. Uh, who who feel uh, sidelined and and uh, and threatened, and I think you had been using to, in our today's uh, discussion the uh, term uh, people are uh, afraid um, uh, to become superfluous. That that they uh, yeah that they, st they are not no longer needed than our in our society. So. What is the answer to that beyond um, improving our educational system and, and trying to empower people uh, to, to keep pace with uh, these uh, dynamics of change we are, we are facing? Which kind of public policies uh, then do we need to um, ensure the, the social coherence and, uh, the, I would say, a kind of inclusivity inclusivity of our economies and of our societies. Maybe, Karen? Yeah, well, I think um, if you ask the economist that I am, the first thing I would think of is ensure social mobility and, and make it possible for people to advance. By the way, not everybody wants to have a, a tougher and better paid job. <laughs> closing the bracket again, but uh, all, all policies that we put into practice should um, allow people to move on and not create an additional ratchet. And that's very tricky stuff when, when it comes to details. And I, I, I remember the debates that we had in the times when we were talking about minimal wages. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that debate has actually been settled by empirical research that was relatively um, neutral in terms of underlying ideologies and values, but the the fear was that a that a minimal wage would harness the labor market and would make it so inflexible that actually those that one wanted to protect would not be protected but would actually suffer because fewer jobs would be available. Um, that is the kind of often counterintuitive question that we need to ask ourselves. And what we've observed is that this actually didn't happen. So um, it, it was it was not so much of a problem. That's what we need empirical research for, to, to check how certain measures will then affect um, the outcome. So if, if that 
experiment had failed and we would have, well, not helped people, but actually made them worse off, um, that, that would have been terrible. And that's, that's the spirit that we need. We, we must allow for improvement, but, but not um, do too much in order to not to stifle the, the, the functioning of the market. I think that's important. Other things beyond economics, um, when it comes to the inclusivity and, and coherence of, of society, I think um, it, is, it is really important that we do have a debate. And I'm very much in favor of these um, systems of participation in, in the democratic debates. We know that not everybody is a politician and not everybody finds time or has the taste for engaging in political action. But um, consulting much more often with uh, people from all kinds of backgrounds and trying to figure out what is important for them and what they're worried about, that I think is really crucial. And there are mechanisms for that that go beyond simple polling. There, there, there are mechanisms that need um, regular forms of asking people questions and giving them feedback. We, we need to engage in a kind of conversation all together and we don't yet really do that sufficiently so I, I think that is important give people the feeling that they not only the feeling but make them express themselves and their wishes and needs and make them see also that that is taken into account we need to have results and we need to deliver as I'm high set thanks go on just to uh coming on that, uh, uh, um, I'm uh, not a big fan of direct democracy, particularly I don't like referenda, uh, but I have to say in our programming we've been piloting a lot of support to direct democracy instruments. Uh, one of them that has really pleasantly surprised me is in the city of Eupen, the German-speaking community of Belgium, where actually introduced a parallel chamber of, uh, you know, directed by a lot where actually people who are drawn simply by lottery, randomly, will set the agenda for the democratically elected politicians. And I, I think that's probably, I'm not saying that this is one size fits all, but there are many different ways of really experimenting the way of, of how democracy can be improved. And here, there was a very simple issue. The issue is that people felt that politicians are not discussing their issues. Mm -hmm. And now this second chamber will actually put the issues and only 80% of the members of the democratically elected parliament, uh, if they vote to eject whatever, the seven time cannabis on the agenda, they can reject <laughs> it, but, uh, but in principle. Uh, that's one thing. In Barcelona, my colleagues have been working a lot with uh, something of a really interesting process of so-called feminization of politics. Ada Colau brought on purpose, I mean, all what we're talking about, more women in politics, they were there with the indignados, they were there in the protest. And, and actually, the city of Barcelona, on purpose, empowered a lot of these people to enter into formal politics, and they have not thought about that before. They, they, they saw themselves more part of a civil society, or maybe at the public squares. And there's a lot, I mean, Gdansk, Messina in Italy, uh, even, you know, Budapest, uh, actually, you know, part of the victory of the, uh, of the uh, social democrat mayor was exactly this unified front and, and a lot of innovative deliberation practices where people from really different walks of ideological and real life came together and said, but we don't like Viktor Orban. We're going to sit down. So I think that exists quite, uh, quite a lot in Europe. I just I don't think it's harnessed at the top level. And sometimes actually it has to be stay. It, it should stay. You know the saying: politics is always local. It, maybe it should stay local, but it gives them legitimacy for the politics to move on and make decisions at national or international level. It brings back the the legitimacy. I think there is a lot to be done at the process. But it, uh. thanks a lot. I would like to. Uh, raise another uh, issue or another I would say, critical development we are facing um, over the last uh, years getting more and more stronger. It, uh, it's about the way we can enable and uh, secure equal participation um, and, and equal opportunities. And uh, we are seeing an upcoming uh, a movement uh, uh, calling for equal participation via collective rights and collective quota based on race, 
gender, um, all kinds of, of uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, criteria, um, uh, uh, empowering uh, the minorities uh, to, to, to get what they think should be their um, share, their legitimate share. Uh, be it in, in uh, uh, the, the economic, uh, the, the, the business world, be it in the academia, academia be it in, in politics. So um, this is about identity politics. Yeah, uh, um, um, develop or, or, or calling for, for collective rights uh, defined by these kind of um, uh, collective I identities. So and, and this, of course, is uh, quite in conflict with the, the traditional liberal narrative, which is about equal freedom and equal individual opportunities, uh, irrespective, irrespective of social status, of gender, of ethnicity. Uh, so and, and now we are. This is uh, we we are we are entering. I would say a, a total. Uh, uh, then different uh, than battle. What 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 is the liberal answer to 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 this uh, development? I'm not sure whether there's a liberal answer, but I'm always a bit skeptical um, because there are multiple identities, or in, you know, in, in, we discuss it also as intersectionality. So it is, you know, I, that. There are these, for instance, am, I am a white woman, right? And I, am, I have a working class background. And so I have, a, I have a clear identity. I have multiple identities and I can name them. But then the question is, they might sometimes conflict with each other or I have to make a decision which is now my primary identity. So um, I find it very hard um, to really think this through. Having said this, though, I think it is important to acknowledge that people feel excluded or even discriminated on the basis of their race, their gender, their religion, their sexual orientation. And that is, and this is what the liberalism is, is about protecting the rights of these groups and giving them equal opportunity, right? So the question is whether these ideas of collective rights are the, the way to go, I, I, I don't think so, for the reasons I just named. And I'm not even sure that's, that, that this will actually change anything. Because I think what we need to do is to find out what people are dissatisfied with. And I don't think they're necessarily dissatisf dissatisfied with liberal democracy as such. Um, so we have to be really careful in trying uh, to believe that there is a quick fix in kind of social engineering. We, we, sort of mm. we issue certain policies mm. and that will solve the problem. I think, um, again, Timothy Garden Ash said something which I find that really struck a nerve here. I think it's about respect. First of all, it's respect and giving these people the feeling that we take their grievances, whatever their grievances are, seriously, rather than trying to avoid them to sort of uh, circumvent them, silence them, or even sort of uh, discard them as, what did he say, what did, what did Clinton say, Depro deplorable, Depro right? Depro or sort of, you know, uh, boxing them as, as racist, xenophobics. Some of them are, but many of them aren't. And so I think it would, we should start also to differentiate, and I just want to pick up one, one, one point you made at the very beginning one. Populism, right-wing populism, is not a problem of, of Central Eastern Europe, right? As you rightly pointed out, not mm. all populists, right-wing, are in Central Eastern Europe, and not all defenders of liberalism are in Western Europe. So I think we need to differentiate and look at people as individuals and find out what their grievances are, take them seriously, respect them, and yes, give them a voice. But it's not that easy. Further comments? Uh, oh, on this, uh, I spend my life in our foundation, not only debating, but where to put the money. Uh, let me give you uh, really a, a, a something, uh, two, two real life experiences. One is talking with my colleagues who work on, uh, in our Roma Initiatives office. They actually put a lot on political emancipation of Roma leaders, mm -hmm. including countries where there is a clear authoritarian or proto-authoritarian governments from Hungary through Serbia through whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but why? They will be also they will become part of the problem. And they say, 
Oh, but that's still a better position. They will be around the table. They will at least they will have some power, mm -hmm. and then we will take it from there. Then we will change the system. I personally do not agree with that uh, theory of changes, as we like to call it in the foundation's world. Um, but it's very interesting that they say, yeah, it's an imperfect world, but even in that imperfect world, I want to have power. Mm -hmm. The second example, uh, example comes from my home country, Macedonia. 2001, basically a civil war was avoided when a hard quota was introduced for the ethnic minority of Albanians. Mm -hmm. And hard quota means like your 25%, 25% of army, police, uh, uh, civil servants, uh, uh, courts, everything should be 25% so that we feel represented by the mm. state and we're not going to take the guns and start a civil war. You know, I'm ethnic Macedonian. Nobody felt right about this. <laughs> Nobody. Because, actually, but I will defend this. It's an imperfect system. Guess what the Albanians who got into the uh, position of power did? Exactly what the ethnic Macedonians were doing. Graft, corruption, imperfect politics, imperfect delivery of services. It was very similar. Nevertheless, I have to say, I would, in that case, I would prefer to get paid the bill at once. And that's the bill that in a way my generation, generation of my parents, generation of their parents, it came probably three generations mm -hmm. because that was like from the communist Yugoslavia, a kind of a heritage. Mm -hmm. And it, it's painful. But I have to say it enabled a clean sheet. I'm not, I'm, I would never advocate for such measures. But I want you to imagine what does it mean uh, uh, and how it's the subjective feeling. Now you go into the public office, Albanian is wildly spoken. Most Macedonians deplore it, mm. but Albanians feel this is my state. I don't need to take mm. a gun and actually change the borders. Or, and, and I think uh, now in this respect, this is probably a radical example, but start thinking about my colleague Ali, who works here, who is a Pakistani, uh, you, you know, uh, Dutch, third generation who lives here in Berlin, or start thinking of people like, what is their perception? Do they, do they feel that actually they're given the chance of emancipation? But not the given the chance, actually, do they think that they're exercising? Because most of the people that you talk, that have an issue with this identity, mm -hmm. they will say, I don't want you to talk on my behalf. I'm able, just give me the space. You know, mm. nothing about us without us. We've heard that mantra, it died with the multiculturalism. But actually, if I think of one of the problems of Europe in the last 30 years, this has not been addressed. And I think we are sitting on a ticking bomb, including Mr. Orban, because he will need a workforce. <laughs> uh, and, and he will have an issue for the declining population. But also more developed uh, economies like this one here, because the issue of identity has not been resolved, neither with the ethnic minorities, but nor with the population that considers that their identity is dominant. Because in some ways in politics, it, it started feeling like a zero sum game. I gave you, and then you won at my expense. I don't think it's true, even, even economically, but we mm. get, with the, with the populist politicians, we get into this zone. And I believe the answer is actually to find, especially on the liberals, because the narrative is right. But the, the, you have to say, how we get out of that zone that people in their daily lives feel that it's a zero-sum game. And if one gains, the other one loses. And I think that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that, that, that's the question. Inevitably, will involve some losses on those who uh, have the positions at the moment. But in the long term, probably not. Mm. So do we have any other questions from the, the audience or comments? No, I think we already dealt with that. Do you have, do you have another one? Yeah. Just a second, uh, a moment of, of no, silence. <laughs> So, uh, does political correctness kill the necessary debates and thus gives oxygen to illiberals? Yes. Another explosive, yes. <laughs> another explosive question. <laughs> Amit Shai. Yes, it does. I think that um, uh, part of having a um, a liberal uh, society uh, and, and a truthful society, an honest, an honest society, fundamentally depends on the freedom of speech, fundamentally depends 
on the ability to express openly, uh, debate, converse, argue uh, over competing notions of, of the good and of the decent and of the indecent. And uh, once we lose that, once we become a culture uh, of virtue signaling and of canceling, you know, the so-called cancel culture, um, we, can't, we can't get to the truth. And, and if we can't get to the truth, what, what uh, possible chance do we have uh, to deal with the enormously complex uh, public policy challenges that we face. So the free flow of information and the ability to air, uh, critique, um, uh, ultimately discount uh, bad ideas, promote good ideas is fundamental to a functional, to a functional society. And it's essential that we maintain uh, the ability to, to raise unpopular ideas and to debate them, and if necessary, to um, uh, discount them. Uh, but to do it in a respectful and constructive uh, manner, understanding that none of us ha ha has a monopoly on, on wisdom. Mm. So I again would say, uh, similar to the, the issue of collective minority rights, uh, it's, it's about a balance between what you had been mentioning, uh, finally, I, I would say a culture of respect, a culture of sensitivity, Uh, especially to to those uh, uh, who are discriminated and uh, are suffering like of uh, racism or uh, other kinds of uh, discrimination. And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, establishing more and more narrow rules Uh, and the prohibition of certain uh, uh, positions of certain narratives of uh, than of certain than political opinions uh, which leads us into censorship and this kind of um, an oppressive than political culture so I again I would say it's not just black and white uh, but finding the right balance um, so I, I think this is um, maybe the, the true liberal answer that you don't always have these kind of uh, ready-made mm -hmm. answers to these problems, but they have to figure it out in the dialogue, in, in, the, in the public dialogue uh, with like, different opinions, different interests, uh, like different groups. Um, Karen, yeah, please. Final remark, because we are approaching um, uh, the the end of our um, time budget. Yes, I but I I needed to say something in order to defend the idea of political correctness a little bit, though. Mm -hmm. um, I I of course cannot endorse it when it comes to well prohibiting speakers from speaking at an event or teachers yeah, yeah. Uh, teaching a certain uh, topic to their class uh, these kinds of things that we, we see mainly in the u.s we don't see it that much in, in germany as yet but the idea behind it was to to try and engage in civilized discourse that does not aim to hurt somebody mm -hmm. uh, verbally and i think that, that i think is a basic virtue of civility that we indeed need and all these people who are complaining so much about um, how political correctness induces um, uh, self-censorship and these people who complain about cancel culture etc these are many of these are people who who tend to say that um, well they are victims and, and they victimize themselves and they they are very strong with their words as well and That again doesn't bring us back into this process of civilized discourse on on values, goals, and tools that that we can can use as individuals and as collectives. So I think the idea behind it is is very important, and we need to get back to that on both sides. Trying not to be offensive as such is is good virtue. It's nothing less than that. So thanks a lot. Uh, to our young speakers and to, to our audience for 
uh, what I think was a quite inspiring then, discussion on a long way uh, of renewing liberalism, uh, which is, as we already uh, said at the beginning, saying nothing new. It's, it's, uh, from the beginning, it has been in an ongoing process of uh, development, renewing, um, uh, answering new uh, ch challenges coming up from uh, the economic or the cultural or the technological uh, than developments. Um, and finally, then we should rely uh, in the strength of liberal democracies um, to reinvent themselves and to find uh, sorry, creative answers to the, the challenges uh, we are facing uh, today. So with that positive note, <laughs> I would like to uh, close our, our discussion. Thank you very much and I uh, hope to, to keep in touch and to continue then our conversation. Thank you. <laughs>